You guys have probably already heard about the controversy surrounding the couple Micah and James, also known as Jim, Stauffer, adopting a son from China and then later giving him up. Although what you might not have heard is that rehoming children is an epidemic. I am aware that many people dislike the term rehoming in regards to children and I'm not too fond of it myself. However, it's what this phenomenon has been dubbed as and is known as. Yet this isn't just a singular case. There are entire online groups dedicated to parents advertising unwanted children for adoption. And there are even unregulated and unlicensed pageant-like shows where children are paraded up and down catwalks in front of potential parents, hoping that they will finally find a home. I really feel the need to talk about this subject. It's something that happens every single day and not many people are talking about it. I'll be covering this topic in two videos, so both aspects of the overarching topic of rehoming children can be given the time they deserve. In this video, I will be using the case of Micah and her family's adoption as an example to highlight the numerous issues including the conditions these adoptees often come from and the effects of being given up after adoption, before moving on to the widespread problem of advertising children in the second video. Micah and James Stauffer release a video called Big Announcement on July 6, 2016, stating that they wish to adopt a little boy from China and were about to begin the process. They already had three biological children but wanted to share their home with a child who really needed one. They document the process, monetizing their videos and accepting sponsorships, as well as releasing a GoFundMe to help with adoption costs. In December 2016, the pair petitioned the World Association for Children and Parents to adopt a one-year-old Chinese boy. He already has his name in which the couple chose for him out there, as well as plenty of photos and videos of him. But I will be censoring any names or faces of this child because I believe he has been exploited enough and deserves privacy. I have opted to give him the pseudonym Bao, a Chinese name meaning treasure. I'll go into why I decided very purposefully to use a Chinese name to refer to him as when we go into the effects of adoption. January 2017. Micah releases a video in which she discusses their doctor giving a negative prognosis for Bao, stating some of the neural imaging the couple had sent over displayed that there could be some serious problems and basically advised against continuing with the adoption. Micah did not listen to the doctor, instead stating, my child is not returnable. October 5th, 2017. The family travels to China to adopt the now two and a half year old Bao. Over the course of the next few months and years, between 2017 to 2020, the family vlogs a lot of their new son, including some behaviours that they find challenging. At some point, Bao was diagnosed with level 3 autistic spectrum disorder. Level 3 is the most severe form of autism. Children with this find it very hard to function, interact socially and deal with a change in focus or location. I'll be covering this in more detail later on in the video. Some of the videos display Micah disciplining Bao using extremely questionable methods, such as using duct tape around his thumb to prevent him sucking on it, despite her older daughter also showing thumb-sucking behaviour, which indicates preferential treatment in favour of her biological children. As well as this, at some point down this timeline, Micah had her fourth biological child, making the total of children in the household five. Micah also shows in these videos that she does not understand how to communicate properly with an autistic child, nor how to discipline them. For example, the time she simply asks him if he's done while he has a meltdown. He has had multiple meltdowns. I'm not having a good day today. We never tell you guys the truth. And that's why you don't see how he's on the vlog. He's probably having a meltdown. Are you done? May 26, 2020, less than three years after adopting Bao, they release an update video stating that they have had to give up the child, citing concerns regarding his behaviour and being unable to help or control him. So, let's summarise this section. Micah and James want to adopt a child from another country. They are warned against this by professionals. They go ahead and do it anyway. They find his behaviours hard to deal with they give him away. 
Before I go into the obvious mistakes made by the staffers and the consequences of their actions, I want to talk about where Bao came from and how this will have impacted him even before he was adopted. Now, I'm going to have to talk about dying rooms. What is a dying room and why do they exist? Dying room is a term coined to describe the structure and conditions of an institution, and due to various factors such as the structure and conditions of the institution, there may be certain places in the building that are essentially rooms for dying. The term was popularised by the 1995 documentary The Dying Room, wherein British filmmakers Kate Blewett and Brian Edwards go to Chinese children's homes and film the neglect within. Chinese orphanages have had a surplus amount of children to attend to in the last few decades, partly because of the one-child policy. I already have a video on the one-child policy and some of the effects that it has had on Chinese society. However, I mostly focused on its effects on men and the phenomenon of bachelor villages. This time we'll talk about the other side of the legislation. The one-child policy was the result of Western pressures on China to control its ever-growing population and declared that Chinese families are limited to one birth per couple. I say birth because families would not be scrutinised should multiple babies be conceived and born at once, such as twins. Only in very select cases were couples permitted to have more than one birth. A couple of these exemptions were if the family were part of a recognised ethnic minority, if the family were from rural areas such as farmers, and in some specific cases if the first child was a girl. However, the policy itself says nothing about the gender of the child, but the fact that there had to be an exemption in certain circumstances to allow a second child on the basis of the first being female says a lot about Chinese attitudes towards women and the preference of sons over daughters. This preference was reflected in the attributes of children who were abandoned, with the overwhelming majority being girls. If a boy was given up, it was likely that he had displayed some kind of physical or developmental abnormality. Boys like Bao. Let's discuss why Chinese way of life is heavily influenced by Confucianism, a philosophy constructed by Confucius, a thinker who lived during the Zhao dynasty. Filial piety, the obedience and devotion towards parents and older family members, is a key aspect of a harmonious and happy life according to Confucianism, and sons in Chinese culture are an important part of this. It is the role of the son to care for parents when they're old and can no longer work. Daughters, on the other hand, are expected to marry and have children. After marriage, they will move into their husband's family home where his parents will also live. If you have a son, that son will marry and your daughter-in-law will come and live with you, and your son and daughter-in-law will take care of you. But if you have a daughter, one day that daughter has to marry and she will go and live with your son-in-law, leaving you without anyone to care for you. There's a saying that very much means this in China. Having a daughter is ploughing somebody else's field. You're raising the daughter only for her to go off and live with somebody else and care for them. The lack of a robust social care system is also a major factor in having a preference for sons. The son being the caretaker of his elderly parents has been an expectation for hundreds of years, and therefore China didn't necessarily have to expand and invest in elderly care. It was a family matter, and not a government obligation. Although China is trying to work on this problem due to the ageing population, the success rates of that are yet to be seen. The ageing population is definitely a problem, with people living longer and having more elderly people than ever, in places like China that aren't necessarily societal structures funded by the government to support this, unlike in the United Kingdom where there may be more government funded care homes for the elderly. There is the option of privatised care, but then we can talk about that when we talk about poverty and what that entails. Coupled with the one-child policy, this emphasised the need for a son more than ever. The lack of social care may also explain the emergence of disabled boys being abandoned. Parents desire an able-bodied, able-minded son to marry, so when they are old, he can work and he and his wife can care for them. Due to the issue of a gender imbalance in modern-day China, with around 105 males to every 100 females, this might be why more recent trends display that disabled children are now more likely to be abandoned when it used to be almost exclusively girls. Furthermore, there is poverty. 
Many of these people didn't want to have to give away their children, nor abandon their children, but circumstances meant that they had to, especially when it came to disabled children. Many parents simply did not have the financial resources to support that child medically and socially. In many rural areas of China, both parents have to work to stay afloat. They wouldn't be able to employ carers to support a child with severe physical, behavioural, and developmental problems to look after them, and they couldn't afford to only have one parent working, nor could they afford to employ carers for when they were old and could no longer look after the child. It's a sad truth of the ways in which some social structures work. And this leads back on to the ageing population. For Chinese parents only having one child and that child being disabled, they would have to have somebody look after that child for their entire lives, and then be able to find themselves a place to live when they could no longer work. It's not feasible for parents who live in poverty. But of course you have to have children, that's traditional Chinese way of life. It all leads back to Confucianism and putting all of your bets on having a healthy, neurotypical son. Yeah. This is what led to an abundance of girls and disabled boys being abandoned. Of course, some of them didn't even reach that point. Some would have their lives ended, whether that be by their parents, other family members or doctors. They may have had their lives ended while being abandoned. For example, a parent may have put them at the side of the highway hoping somebody would pick them up, but they would die due to exposure. Although the figures are really hard to estimate in regards to how many children lost their lives. The one-child policy caused an influx of orphanages receiving more and more children. In the past, if a couple had a daughter or a disabled child, they may be able to keep them because they could have more children, or they would have been able to care for them in a different way because they would have had siblings to help. But now they could only have one, and that meant that the girl or disabled boy had to go. Unfortunately, the orphanages weren't prepared for this. A lot of times when it came to orphanages, they were civil servants. They weren't even necessarily care workers. They didn't apply for this job specifically because they wanted to care for children. They were simply assigned to the task by the government in response to the rapid influx of children in orphanages. Not only were the staff themselves possibly lacking the passion that is required to care for children as they didn't apply for this job specifically, they may also have lacked experience that they needed to do it effectively. The conditions of some of these orphanages could also be abhorrent. There's very little space to cram all of these children in, and even with staff there, there was not enough staff to care for the amount of children that they were receiving. They would manage to mostly feed and change them, but children need a hell of a lot more than that. They need interaction, comfort, stimulation to develop properly, and they weren't getting that. A lot of the time they'd be left in a small cot, and in some cases they would be tied to a potty chair all day. A lot of the children would have many strange behaviours, such as rocking repetitively. This is a self-soothing behaviour that babies and young children do if they aren't getting the right amount of attention and interaction they need. They will constantly rock backwards and forwards, and this can be seen with a lot of children who are left in orphanages. Upon investigating some of these orphanages, foreign media dubbed certain rooms in these places dying rooms, where they would find children unattended, left on their own, on a bed, some of them seriously ill or dying. That is the historical context and the social context of why so many children were and are still being abandoned in China. The one-child policy has since been abolished in China with couples now being allowed to have up to three children, but its effects still remain to this day. It could be possible that Bao, Micah and James's son, came from that very environment. We've gone over the possible conditions of Bao's life pre-adoption, but what of the issues during and after the adoption? And how could the Stoffers have eased the process for him? Before I delve into these points, I want to give a detailed overview of Autistic Spectrum Disorder. This is the diagnostic criteria for Autism Spectrum Disorder. I have seen some other official sources refer to it as Autistic Spectrum Disorder and not Autism Spectrum Disorder. I think previously in this video I did refer to it as Autistic Spectrum Disorder because of the source I was looking at. But whether it's ism or istic, we're talking about ASD. 
To meet the diagnostic criteria for ASD, according to the DSM-5, a child must have persistent deficits in each of three areas of social communication and interaction, plus at least two of four types of restricted, repetitive behaviours. A. Persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts, as manifested by the following, currently or by history. 1. Deficits in social-emotional reciprocity, ranging, for example, from abnormal social approach and failure of normal back-and-forth conversation, to reduced sharing of interests, emotion or effect, to failure or initiate or respond to social interaction. 2. Deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviours used for social interaction, ranging, for example, poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication, to abnormalities in eye contact and body language, or deficits in understanding and use of gestures, to a total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication. 3. Deficits in developing, maintaining, and understand social relationships ranging, for example, from difficulties adjusting behaviour to suit various social contexts, to difficulties in sharing imaginative play or in making friends, to absence of interest in peers. Specify current severity. Severity is based on social communication impairments and restricted, repetitive patterns of behaviour. B. Restricted repetitive patterns of behaviour, interests or activities, as manifested by at least two of the following currently or by history. 1. Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech, e.g. simple motor stereotypes, lining up toys or flipping objects, echolalia, idiosyncratic phrases. 2. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, or ritualised patterns of verbal or non-verbal behaviour, e.g. extreme distress at small changes, difficulties with transitions, rigid thinking patterns, greeting rituals, and need to take the same route or eat the same food every day. 3. Highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus, e.g. strong attachment to or preoccupation with unusual objects, excessively circumscribed or perseverative interests. 4. Hyper or hyperreactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment, e.g. apparent indifference to pain slash temperature, adverse response to specific sounds or textures, excessive smelling or touching of objects, visual fascination with lights or movement. Specify current severity. Severity is based on social communication impairments and restricted repetitive patterns of behaviour. C. Symptoms must be present in early developmental period, but may not be fully manifest until social demands exceed limited capacities, or may be masked by learning strategies in later life. D. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of current functioning. D. These disturbances are not better explained by intellectual disability, intellectual developmental disorder or global developmental delay. Intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder frequently co-occur. To make comorbid diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, social communication should be below that is expected. Note, individuals with a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder or pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified should be given the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Individuals who have marked deficits in social communication but whose symptoms do not otherwise meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder should be evaluated for social pragmatic communication disorder. Specify if, with or without accompanying intellectual impairment, with or without accompanying language impairment, associated with a known medical or genetic condition or environmental factor, associated with another neurodevelopmental, mental or behavioural disorder, with catatonia. Refer to the criteria for catatonia associated with another mental disorder. You have no idea how many times I had to re-record some of those words. And now I'm going to dive into cultural transition. Bao was two and a half years old at the time of his adoption, born and raised in China. This means he was already living in a completely different culture and raised to speak and understand a completely different language. Any child would have found it difficult to adjust to such a massive change. But as mentioned before, 
Bao has autism and we have just read out the diagnostic criteria for it. Transition and change are very hard for children with autism to cope with. They find comfort in routine and repetition. Moving home is one thing. Moving across the globe to a country with a completely different culture and primary language is another. This is why I specifically chose a Chinese pseudonym for the Stolfer's adopted child. One method of making things much easier for him would have been to keep his Chinese name and learn some simple Chinese phrases to use with him. This would have given him a sense of cultural familiarity to hold on to and allow Bao to feel more comfortable being around and communicating with the family. Then we go on to communication, which was also a highlighted issue for children with autism. If you want to communicate with a child, who has autism, who is having a meltdown, you don't simply ask them mid-meltdown or just after the meltdown if they're done yet. This isn't how it goes. You have to take into account certain stresses that the child may be experiencing that cause this meltdown. Stimulation is a problem for many children with autism. They can become overstimulated very quickly. And this was a house of three children when he first arrived, and then along came a baby. I can imagine it was a very busy and loud house, which could have caused problems for Bao when becoming overstimulated. They could have provided him with a safe, quiet place to go when he was feeling overwhelmed. But it seems instead, Micah would rather just ask him if he was done yet. This is possibly linked to the thumb-sucking behaviours. Bao may have found sensory pleasure by doing so. A lot of children with autism like very sensory things, especially touch. Just let the guy suck his thumb. I understand that Micah said it was causing blisters. I haven't seen any evidence of this. If it was causing blisters, I'm sure there was a much more humane way of cutting down on the thumb-sucking than using duct tape. Micah also talks about him throwing tantrums around food, demanding more food. We are having meltdowns because we've already had breakfast and we just want to keep eating and it's not time to eat. So we're going to sit down. Sit down. We have to wait. You can have a snack. And I kind of have to break it to you, Micah, but number one, he has autism and therefore routine may be very important to him. He's in a completely different time zone to what he's used to be. Of course, there's going to be some upset when it comes to routines. He has autism. What might have been more helpful is if you printed off pictures of food representing breakfast, lunch and dinner and put it in a little timeline for him with a clock so he could see what time food was coming, which would also assure him if he happened to have food aggression. Because I hate to break it to you, Micah, but a lot of children that go into these orphanages often come from poverty-stricken families where they don't know if they're going to get fed or not today. And a lot of these orphanages are understaffed, so there isn't a set lunchtime, it's just when the staff manage to get to that specific child that day. Alongside the autism, of course it's going to cause stress around food. Think it through. Another problem we're going to go into is attachment disorder. Now, I already do have a video on reactive attachment disorder and attachments, so I won't be going into it in too much detail. But essentially, the theory goes that your attachment to your primary caregiver as a child will inform how well you do with attachments later in life. The quality of care a primary caregiver gives to an infant also informs future attachments. So if you have an unstable and unhealthy relationship to your primary caregiver because they're are often absent or they neglect you, you're going to learn pretty quickly that you can't trust other people. When babies cry, they are often crying for food, for comfort, for being changed. And if those things don't happen when they cry, later on in life, they're learning to just suppress their emotions. The subconscious has picked up on the fact that no matter how hard they cried, no one came for them. And therefore, in the future, they may be less likely to ask for help or show any emotions whatsoever. It can cause insecure and insecure avoidant attachments. Again, you can look at my last video on that for a deeper dive. What this will lead up to are adults who tend to avoid intimate adult relationships. They may not trust people, they may not ask for help, and they may be very shut off with their emotions, which can cause long-term psychological damage. And let's look at Bao. At some point, he was handed over or found by an orphanage. 
He lived there with lots of staff going in and out all of the time and therefore likely didn't get a lot of attention and maybe just had his basic needs met without much stimulation or interaction, was then adopted by the Storfers and then a few years later was given up by them. It's disrupted attachment followed by another disrupted attachment. And when these insecure attachments begin to affect a person's functionality within society, that's when it becomes a disorder. I really, really hope that Bao is able to heal from this and does not end up with an attachment disorder because that can be extremely hard to deal with. The Storfers overlooked everything that I've just mentioned and went for it, which possibly may have harmed this little boy for the rest of his life. I seriously hope that is not the case. He deserves so much more based on what we know about where he could have come from. I don't want to discourage people from adopting from China or any other country. If you genuinely think you have the resources to take care of a child that desperately needs a home and love, then do so. But please make sure that you are prepared for any outcome, no matter how difficult or challenging the situation may become. Because these are children and they will be affected by any decision that you make. I wanted to cover this case because I think it perfectly illustrates many issues, from the conditions these children come from to any complications that come with international adoption. I will be doing a part two where I talk about the much wider spread problem, but I just want to take a minute to say I really do hope that Bao is doing a lot better that he found a family that are passionate and are ready and equipped to deal with him and his needs and help him in the long run, and that the Storfers serve as an example of what happens when you don't look into things properly, because not for one second do I think these people actually thought about it properly. In part two, I will be talking about the much wider spread problem that has a lot more insidious aspects to it. But to highlight this case again, because it wasn't just a story that came and went by, this is something that happened that will affect this little boy for the rest of his life. I really, again, hope he got the help that he deserves and is flourishing. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.